How are you? I'm doing very well. How are you doing, Tom? I'm good. It was nice to see you. Uh, get, uh, nice to see your reaction to them. My drummer saw this, and now he's a cameraman. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> but you're, you're doing all right in the pandemic and all that? You know what, man? I, I'm doing okay. I, I know it's really rough for people and, and definitely you know, forced my family and I to make a lot of changes. But to be around my family at this time is, is definitely a special thing. You were introduced to the drums when you were two. Do you remember the feeling it first gave you? Ooh. You know what? Um, music being a part of my family for generations, it was something that we did as a, you know, a communal thing, a thing we did to get together and have fun. And so I just remember positive experiences. I remember a lot of training from my, my dad and my mom, but um, just it felt like home is what I would say. Were you, uh, were you good at it right away? That's a very interesting question to define good. Um, I think what I had, um, especially being in that environment, you know, my parents coaching me, I definitely had a talent and and I would say I was good for my age. That's being nice. Two and three. That, that, yeah. that's, that's, that's good. That's good. Um, yeah, I mentioned the new project is a reimagining of your first album. We, we, we just heard a little bit of it. What made you want to revisit your first record? Well, um, like most people, we would love a second chance at things. And so <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I actually wanted to uh, revisit this, this music, uh, but to have the video as well. That was a big part that I didn't have based on the way that I had done the first record. And so getting a second chance after touring with my band across you know, Canada and some, a couple of spot dates in the U.S., and also missing the opportunity to, to be touring the world, which we were scheduled to do in 2020, um, just figured I would just go to studio and uh, have a good time. Um, I want to go back to the, the musical beginnings. Um, you cut your teeth playing at church, right? Correct. Your dad was musical director? Yeah. So tell me about that. What's it like learning from your dad? What do you remember from that? Mm. I remember a lot of arguments. That's what I remember. <laughs> and, you know, it's because he was so passionate, is so passionate about music, he really strived for excellence, really wanted, you know, um, my my siblings and I to to strive for excellence in anything we did and he was just happy that we chose music and a quick shout out um, to my little sister Kathy who's the youngest of the three of us and my younger brother Ricky Lewis who's also the drummer for the weekend and is playing at the Super Bowl this year which is pretty awesome so that's oh good. that's pretty I mean if you weren't going to watch it anyway that's a good reason to be tuning in hey yeah <laughs> what is what did your dad play uh, multi-instrumentalist so mainly keys and guitar and uh, and did you guys play together when you were kids growing up? Yeah, absolutely. Lots of jamming. Um, one of the earliest memories I have was actually jamming with my grandfather, who had played violin when we were jamming. And um, yeah, even the family get-togethers at Christmas. You know, my dad's side of the family mainly, but all of us, you know, my uncles, my brother and I, my dad, we'd just be switching instruments and just having fun. Can, can you tell me a piece of advice or something that your father gave you that might be sticking with you until now? Up till now, I should say, not until now. <laughs> Oh my gosh, he said that the drums can't feel, so hit the drums. <laughs> That's it. Especially as a Caribbean man, you could imagine what that sounded like. But yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> is, it ever, is it ever overwhelming to know the expectations or, or, or knowing that you have such a musical family? As you mentioned, your, your, your mom and your sister are musicians too. Your brother's drumming for the weekend and has been doing for some time. Your father's a great musician. Does that ever, is, is that ever something you have to carry? Yeah, definitely something I have to carry. Um, but at the same time, I've I've learned to cherish it because it's my history. It's my, um, you know, it's what I have of the past. You know, I don't know too much about my family beyond my great grandfather, and even that is very little information. And so to know that you know, without too much effort in the beginning of life for me, that I have that connection and it's a very clear connection. I definitely hold it and appreciate it. When you say learned to cherish it, um, like all like all kids, we can be we can be silly about this kind of stuff. At, at some point, did you did you not feel that way? I think it wasn't necessarily about not cherishing it, but you know, you grow and you, you as you get mature, you know, more mature, you start to understand um, who you are and your identity and you know the things that create this person that is you. And so, you know, taking it for granted because it was 
easy at first because of my environment was something, but not in a way where I disrespected the art. You know, I always practiced. Um, I was in love with music constantly in bands, multiple bands in school, multiple bands outside of school. Uh, first gig when I was seven years old. So, you know, there's a lot of pressure when you're at that age and there's definitely an expectation. But overall, I think when I say to cherish it, I mean, it's just to hold on to that part of my history. Well, was there ever an expectation to not stay outside of, of the church when it comes to music? Uh, what do you mean? I mean, when it comes to when you when you play within the, when you play in the church, you could have you could have a very good career for the rest of your life playing in 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 church, right? I, I wonder if there was ever any I don't know any complicated feelings you might have about playing outside of it. Absolutely, yeah. that in itself is a I don't know a special in itself to talk about <laughs> because it's. It's, uh, you know, um, when you're dealing with the difference between sacred music and what's known as secular music, you know, and how that um, is looked upon in the community, how you have your own individual convictions about it, um, there are many moments where you are torn about what it is that you're involved in and how you feel about that. And I've, you know, I've taken the time, I've done the studying, I've, I've really centered myself and also done my best to position myself in situations where I don't feel like I'm being compromised, where I feel like as an individual, um, my message is clear and people respect that, you know, which is great. That's a beautiful answer. You got quite a resume under your belt. You worked with folks like Quincy Jones and Gregory Porter and Pat Metheny, just to name a few. But again, most people would know you for your work with Snarky Puppy. Let's take a listen to a bit of that now. And you're really good. That's an outlier from the band Snarky Puppy featuring my guest Larnell Lewis on drums. It's off Snarky Puppy's album, We Like It Here. So I wonder if you can tell me the story that I heard about making this record, that you had like seven hours to learn all this music. Can you tell me that story? Oh my gosh. I mean, if there was ever a moment where I felt pressure, um, it's, a, it's a scenario I've been familiar with. I've been and experienced a few times, like I mentioned, for my first gig when I was seven. I was at rehearsal with my dad and the drummer couldn't make it. And he turned around to this seven year old playing with his brother in some cars and says, you know, can you, do you, do you want to play drums? Do you know the music? Do you want to get in? And I had to figure it out really quickly. And so it's definitely been a, a part of my journey. And again, with Snarky Puppy, uh, got the call two days before. I was actually scheduled to do a live recording with the Toronto Mass Choir the night before the flight. So I had all this other music in my head. And then when the music came in, got on the flight, stayed up the whole flight, made minimal notes just to, so I could retain something. And when I landed in the Netherlands, there was another song in my inbox, <laughs> which I had to learn on the drive to Utrecht. And of course, when I got in, you know, everyone was waiting for me pretty anxiously. And uh, I, we did a four hour rehearsal. I got some food in me. And we hit it. We did two concerts for each day, three days. And the first concert was at night, took a short break, did the second concert. And I decided to skip out on the evening jam that they did, because at this point I had probably been up for about 20 some odd hours. That's, I mean, and not only, <laughs> you couldn't play, obviously you couldn't play drums on, on the flight. You had to just internalize all this music. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine what, what, what goes to your... What goes through your mind at a time like this? Because simultaneously, it's so challenging, but it's also like the opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah, you know, the a few things that go through my mind are one, you know, accept the moment. Um, I'm not here by mistake, so whatever I have is what I need for the job and for the. And that took a lot of time um, throughout my career. You know, advice to any young musicians: just always study, take your time, and really pay attention to different styles of music and learn nuances. But after you do your homework, it's about the instinct. And so that's why they called me, because they believed in my instincts. And we had built a relationship, uh, I guess, maybe about a year and a half, almost two years prior. What a beautiful feeling that must be to work and work and work. I mean, it, it, not everything in your life is, is gigs and, and interviews. It's a lot of, you know, hours and hours and hours of practice to know that you had put in all of this time 
And then when the opportunity comes, I mean, it's tales all this time, but you, you can meet it because you were ready for it, right? Absolutely. And so that's a beautiful thing. Uh, I want to give people a, a, a better idea of what you can do here. Take a listen to this. And that, my friends, is a Larnell Lewis solo. It's part of a live performance of City Lights, a song on his uh, latest album, Relive the Moment. Solos are interesting because I think there's something that even a casual music fan can get. And I think even if you're outside of the genre of music, even if you're not a fan of the genre of music, a solo within the music can help bring you in. So I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. Oh. <laughs> what are the key ingredients to a good solo? Ooh. Okay, so um, that's a great question. Um, I learned from a comedian. I was playing drums as a part of the house band for a, a show, a comedy show. The comedian was uh, Jay Martin. So shout out to Jay Martin, uh, local legend. And uh, he he was making fun of drummers because whenever they do drum solos, you know, it starts out kind of groovy and everyone's like, yeah, and they're dancing. And then all of a sudden it gets a little more complex and then maybe complicated and everyone loses the beat and they're just kind of sitting there staring. And that was a wake-up call on stage. In fact, I've learned many lessons on stage. And so with that, the key for me is to obviously be able to express yourself. But if somebody with minimal experience can understand what's going on and they can feel the, uh, you know, the ebb and flow of that solo, of that moment, of that expression, then to me that is a, is a big, big part of it. That's interesting. It sounds like there are sort of rules you, you, you have internalized about how you want to communicate that, that, that solo. Yeah, you know, if I'm playing at the Rex downtown Toronto and I have this massive drum solo, I want to be able to end the solo in a way that the people at the bar know exactly what beat it is. You know what I'm saying? Like it just needs to be, it needs to be known and understood. And I, I don't want to mislead or misdirect anybody from from the message of like, you know, here's a moment I'm making you feel something. There's some tension. There's some release, and we're now about to bring it back home and reconnect. You know, uh, to the rest of the band. You're now one of the most acclaimed drummers in, in all, of, all of Canada. Um, but as we mentioned, it took a long time to get there. It took a lot of work to get there. And my guess is it took a lot of, um, we'll say, cringeworthy performances <laughs> to get there. Do you got any stories? Oh, I got too many stories, man. <laughs> wow, what story would I give? Okay, I'm going to give one from my early and then one from not so early. So my early years playing in church, just starting up in church, um, first concert at four years old, I'm playing for praise and worship at this point, and I'm maybe about six. This is before I started doing competitions in Church of God. Um, I'm playing, it's a worship tune, but it's rubato. At this point, I have no clue what that means, which is out of time. It is more expressive. The music is just moving. My aunt is at the altar praying, hands up, eyes closed in, you know, the moment. Again, I'm six. The the music is playing and, you know, it's just a very worshipful song and I have no clue what beat. So I'm starting to play a couple of beats and I'm trying to figure out which beat this song is. I'm like, I know this. I think I know this. And I know the lyrics, but, you know, spirit of the living God. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And then she's kind of giving me these bad looks while she's trying to pray and focus. <laughs> and she gets so frustrated that she just puts her hands down in defeat comes to the drums, kicks me off the drums and takes the mallets from me and starts doing cymbal washes. And I was like, right, drum lesson. Thanks, Aunt. <laughs> Shout out to Aunt Um And then, of course, another moment, um, I had spent a lot of time playing with the one and only Matt Dusk. And so um, I was still in college. It was my first time into the U.S. as a uh, well, you know, not my first time in the U.S., a first time touring. So we had spent two months at the Golden Nugget in, uh, in Las Vegas. And uh, I got on stage and I was in control of the laptop, which had the backing tracks. So I, I needed to make sure the tempos were good and all the tracks were in order. But by accident, I skipped tracks. Yeah. Whoa. So I did it once. And he's like, I guess you don't like that song. And I'm like, no, I like that song. I, I swear. He's like, we, we didn't play it tonight. What do you mean? 
And then, of course, it happened, and I skipped the next night two songs. Oh. <laughs> and so that's how I learned from Steve McDonald, the musical director with Matt, Matt Dusk, how to actually approach musicians. And, you know, he met me. And he said, look, we got to have a meeting. We need to talk about this. Obviously, you know, it's really frustrating to not be able to play your songs. Let's do a test. And so he sat me down and he was very calm with me um, and took his time, you know. And so that was a huge, huge lesson for me, not only in how to correct those issues, but how to talk to a younger musician when you want to help them correct those issues. That's beautiful. Well, let's keep it moving with this. This is Q. I'm Tom Power with my guest, drummer Larnell Lewis. That's a bit of a reimagining of the title track to his 2018 debut album, In the Moment. Larnell's latest project is Relive the Moment, sees him revisit other key songs off that debut album. Is that a, is that a kalimba? What instrument is that? Ah, great question. So it is a uh, in beer song, a sound. In, it's like a beer. kalimba. Yeah. But um, it's, it's actually, I'm performing this on what's called the DTX M12, which is a percussion pad, electronic percussion pad from Yamaha. So it took quite a bit of programming to get the notes arranged in, you know, different ways, multiple notes on one pad. But it's an expressive piece that I usually do as a palate cleanser during my, uh, my live show. Tell me a little bit where, where that piece came from. It came from needing to create peace. Um, As musicians, you know, we have this ability to not only create for others, but to also create for ourselves. And so, you know, when things are chaotic, when things are insane, when things are intense and you just need a moment, you know, sometimes my brother and I would actually get together and jam on instruments with the lights off and just really relax and kind of throw the day through the notes, just kind of pass it through this waterfall of notes and just let it go. And so that piece was an example of, you know, something that is a, a habit for me. It's just to really just play my day away, whatever it is. Um, you know, I, I should say most people listening to this are, are definitely aware of what a drummer does, appreciate the role of drums within a song. Do you think drummers get the respect they deserve? When you uh, relate or, or compare a large pizza to a drummer with a really bad joke, which people can probably find online. Yeah, I don't think drummers are getting enough respect. I think it goes something like, you know, what's the difference between a drummer and a large pizza? And it's a large pizza can feed a family of four. It's like, but I'm ching. So yeah, I, I, I mean, everyone gets hit, but I don't think drummers get the, the respect they deserve. Why do, you, why, why do you think that is? I think the role of the drums while understood in music um, I think the um, in, in a song, I think just the energy, if you are in a, a band with a drummer, it's hard. If you're not in a band with a drummer, it's hard to understand how the drummer can push and encourage other musicians to do what they do. And so as a drummer, you need to be aware of the music and, you know, harmonics and everything else. And it can just be, I know for me, when I'm playing in those situations, I'm hearing the chords that are going by and I'm trying my best to add to, you know, the flair and the flavor of the harmonics that are going on. So I need to be aware. I'm participating in the 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 forward motion or helping it to rest, whatever it is. But it's it's all music. I mean, music, dare I say, is 80% rhythm. So how dare you, people? <laughs> <laughs> what what do you what do you wish people knew knew about percussion? What do you wish more people knew about drums? That everyone needs to play drums. That, that everyone needs to understand that no matter what instrument you play, you participate in rhythm. And so even though we are an indefinite pitched instrument community, um, you know, you still need a rhythm, even if you put harmony on it. So how about that? What is your family? I mean, you're an incredibly accomplished musician now. What does your family think about the path you've chosen? What does your, your family think about what you've accomplished at this point? Um, they're really, really proud of me, which is, you know, I, I couldn't have asked for more. Um, they probably wish I took the garbage out a couple more times, but you know, Hey, the past is the past, (laughs) but yeah, they, 
they, you know, I think they, they've, they've seen me grow. They understand my journey and to know all the hard work and the late nights and, you know, even them picking me up and dropping me off that investment, I think any parent would be relieved when you, when you've taken the time and you can see that you're, you're, you know, your son or daughter, you know, your child, they're okay. You have kids of your own, right? I do. How old? Three and one going on. 19 and 21. <laughs> so what happens if one of them comes to you and says, dad, I want to be a musician. What do you tell them? Mm. That we are going to go to the Canada council of the arts. We're going to also talk to the Ontario council of the arts <laughs> and we're going to support you as much as we can. Cause uh, there's support out here in Canada, which is great. So we, if they want to do that, I will tell them everything that they want to know. Uh, you know, for a long time, fans of your work or even for people who are getting introduced to you in this interview right now, I guess this is a bit of a broad question, but what do you hope they get when they hear your music? I hope when they hear my music that they can see the light in their life and that they are able to hold on to that light and, and cherish it and always be able to reflect on it and relive those moments that bring them that light. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you. You know, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's lovely to talk to you. I can tell that, you know, the, the spirit is never too far from the music that you're playing. You know, going back to what we were saying about uh, secular and sacred music and all that stuff. And that's certainly a distinction that's important. But I can hear the spirit in all of the music that you play. Thank um, you. And it's lovely to talk to you about it. Thanks for your time. Absolutely. You too, man.